Hello and welcome to Roll to One. I am Jaden Arnold, and like I said, I'm back, we're back, and we're tonight playing Whispers of Old Harbor. But before we get to that excitement in our 1920s setting, I'm going to introduce a few of my friends. Some old, some new, and some young. Ha ha. All right, I'll begin with you. Who are you? Hello, my name is Quentin. I've been on a couple of specials on the channel before, so glad to actually get to participate in the campaign. All right, who are you? I'm Joe. You know me. <laughs> that, that's true. At this point, they have seen you DMing. Congrats. All right, and who are you? I'm Taylor. This will be my second time on the show. Sweet. Uh, yeah. Yep. And I'm Ross. This will also be my second time on the show. I did the Orbit 2 one, one shot a few months ago. All right. Well, without further ado, let's get ready for tonight's episode of Whispers of Old Harbor. <laughs> Welcome to Harborview, Delaware, a sprawling coastal town where the echo of the bygone era meets the fervor of modern ambitions. Imagine this, the heart of a town known as the Old Harbor District boasts colonial brick buildings that seem untouched by time. Their regal facades are complemented by quaint cobblestone streets underfoot. While some corners might remind you of a simpler past with the gentle trot of horse-drawn carriages, the streets are alive with the rattle and hum of Model T forts and Chevys, a sign of an age of transformation. Now cast your eyes to the mammoth enterprise by the shoreline, the Harborview Fisheries Co. It's more than just a factory, though. It's a monument to the town's lifeblood. Seagulls cry overhead as fishermen haul in their daily catch, and the bustling market district stalls brim not only with the day's freshest seafood, but also imported luxuries that make even the most discerning shopper's heart race. On that horizon, a new vision for Harborview takes shape. The business district, cranes and scaffolding reach for the sky, representing the promise of a grand future. Word around town speaks of an unprecedented collaboration between a businessman named Harrison Sinclair and government official Governor William Denny. The aim? To pave way for an opulent boulevard catering to the country's elites. Think Las Vegas or something similar. Venture then a little further, and the town unfolds into a spacious avenue where four grand mansions stand tall, sprawling out like a fork in the road, each beacon of wealth and power, each home to one of Harborview's foremost families. Old money or new money. Their tales of legacy and intrigue are now whispered in hushed tones across town. But not all whispers are about old money and power plays. The 1920s in America come with their own set of challenges. The Prohibition era might have outlawed the sale of alcohol, but in the dimly lit alleys of Harborview, the Lizard Tail Syndicate has found their illicit stride. Their dark reputation grows with each passing day, offering a stark reminder that behind the shimmer of this era lurks a world of shadows. With glamour and mystery, prosperity and peril, Harborview is more than just a town. It's located in Delaware in 1926. It is October 15th. That's a Friday. The weather is lovely, but the sun is going down. It's a saga now, waiting to unfold. And you, my dear players, are at the very heart of it. We begin with Harry Henderson in the Harborview Police Station. As you step over the threshold and of the Harborview Police Station doorway, the weight of responsibility is evident on your shoulders. Your posture upright, signaling both respect for your new, possibly temporary role, and a determination to succeed. The old wooden floorboards creak beneath your weight, echoing the history of the precinct. Please describe your character, Ross, and who they are. Yeah, uh, I will be playing uh, Harrison Harry Henderson, he is a PI who is new to Herberview. Uh, he is a World War I veteran, and afterwards he's gotten into police work and PI work after the war. All right. You reach the office door, hearing now the sounds in this office. You pause for a moment. A janitor, a weathered old man who has seen generations of officers come and go. He's diligently scraping off the name of your predecessor. However, you are not a full-time hire. You are a private eye filling the role that has been recently vacated. However, Harry Henderson, PI, is drying as the janitor has just finished painting them. The janitor turns around and smiles, and he speaks. You must be the new detective. You know, I've been here a long time. 
you have any questions, anything at all, I'd ask them now before the chief finds out you're finally here. Well, yep, I'm the new guy, and the first question I want to ask is, uh, what's your name, good sir? How can I uh, address you? <laughs> I've seen your kind before, young and eager. This town has its shadows, and I'm one of them. You don't need my name, detective. You just need to know what's in the next step forward. All right. So, uh, what's the situation around here? What's uh, what's one thing that you, what's one piece of advice you give a new detective to town? Hmm. Detective Roland, your predecessor. He was a good man. Always said a kind word for me, but he was digging into some deep stuff. Heard he was on something big for well. You know. You know. I just, all right. Uh, how long ago did he uh, uh, leave the position, so to, let's say? Not long ago. Uh, I'd say maybe a month. Okay. Do you know what specifically he was working on? Just know that he was uh, working on something that he shouldn't have been looking into. Now, I don't like to spread rumors, but the whispers about them lizards sneaking around. Mm. They had their claws deep in some pockets and possibly some detectives. Uh, that's the Lizard Tail Syndicate, correct? I'm new to town, still figuring out all of the players. Sure, I'd, I'd keep it to nicknames and uh, uh, whispers. Gotcha. Okay. Wouldn't want to meet the same fate. Thank you, good sir. Sure, anything else? I think, uh, hopefully, we'll have many more good conversations like this over time. All right. And he opens the door pleasantly for you. He smiles, um, bowing his balding, you see, in the back of his head. And you enter. Uh, inside the office, the ambience speaks of a history and countless cases, dark wooden paneling, an ancient oak desk scattered with papers, and a vintage typewriter. Of course, vintage for us. You know. Yeah. <laughs> An ashtray, though, brims with cigarette butts, um, attesting to many late night contemplations. The area has been left alone, maybe for honor of the old detective or because the janitor you just talked to is lazy. <laughs> I don't know. An imposing cabinet sits to one side, though. Its drawers filled with dossiers from years gone by as you reach around and, and explore your new space. However, opposite that is a corkboard. It's plastered with photographs, newspaper clippings, and hand-drawn maps of Harborview, the beginnings of your web of shadows you were hoping to unravel. Each telling a tale of crime and resolution, though, the center of the desk are many, many folders, stamped with the Harborview police emblem. One such folder draws your attention immediately. You may open your folder that I have presented to you all. Um, you each have a folder. That being yours, you are allowed to open and read. The top one, you should read privately to yourself. Uh, that is to not be shared with anyone at this table. That is for your eyes only. If you do share, that is on your own prerogative. However, you are not near any of the other players currently. So I would keep that to yourself for now. Um, as you begin to very quickly read, though, Ke Chief Calvin Strongwell enters. His dominating presence fills the room, and should you need a description later, we will, of course, give you that. But for now, he says, um, he begins voice deep and gravelly, Henderson, you've got big shoes to fill now. And you are obviously jumped by his presence. Um, and he says, starting with tonight, you're accompanying me to the Waterford party. Best to get, know, best to, get to know the movers and shakers of Harborview. I'll see you there, and of course, you'll need this. The second thing in yours. I would like you to read it out loud. Everything on that. Um, and then, of course, when we get to the 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 front for all of you all, you will, of course, not read the stuff we've heard before. However, each of these letters has a private message written for the person in which it was delivered. Of course, you look immediately to the back, recognizing it is not your own name that it was written to, as you recognize this is a invitation written for Chief Strongwell, mm -hmm. and you are his plus one. Okay. So, you may begin telling us what is on the such invitation. Well, uh, on the front, so there is a picture of a mansion, uh, just kind of as a decorative thing. And then it says, join us in f fundraising to save Harborview Manor, October 15th, uh, Friday, 8 p.m., Waterford Manor, Harborview, Delaware. And that's all that's on the front. 
And then on the back, you are cordially invited to a fundraising gala hosted by Gerald Waterford. Your esteemed presence is requested in an effort to save the historical mansion from being torn down. Every bit of support counts towards preserving a piece of Harborview's heritage. And then the handwritten thing. Dear Chief St uh, Stonewell, over the years, our paths have intertwined in various capacities, and I am deeply grateful for your discreet understanding. Harborview thrives when its leaders co cooperate, and your commitment has not gone unnoticed. I sense, however, a growing unease. I understand that some paths we walk upon are rockier than others, sorry, and I respect the weight of the badge you wear. This gala might just be the venue for us to discuss our concerns. The future holds many possibilities, and I believe that together we can find a way to realign our interests to benefit both of us and our beloved Harborview. Anticipating a constructive conversation, Gerald Waterford. Nice. All right, so now you may privately, of course, read your letter that I interrupted you with. Thanks. Um, but the scene will transition. Give me one moment. All right. We transition to a lavish hotel suite. The window open, we can hear the nearby city. This room adorned in the finest 1920s luxury. Of course, you're quite high up. As you look past the furniture, you see um, a town that is more of a city than a town, truly. But it doesn't quite reach city officially. So I'll be referring to it as a town uh, or city, depending, interchangeably. But, but it is, of course, still a town. Um, this room, uh, its finest luxuries, boasts deep maroons and golden trims. It's a very fancy hotel. Rich wooden furniture and a large open window lets in the ambient noise of the town below. Seated at the vanity, the reflection of Lilith King commands attention. A woman of undeniable allure, her fair skin contrasts sharply with waves of raven black hair that cascade down her back. Dressed in an emerald silk gown, the fabric clings to her svelte figure, its intricate beaded patterns glinting subtly with every movement. Her makeup flawless and deliberately minimal, showcasing piercing blue eyes that seem to harbor countless secrets. Delicate hands adorned with a few statement pieces of jewelry, one in particular on her left ring finger, moving with precision as she applies a deep red shade to her lips. Emerging from the ensuite bathroom, Sammy Nuck, a cardiano, towering and muscular frame, fills the doorway. As you stand there in a towel, please describe me your character, Joey. Um... Sam, or Sammy, to his close friends, um, is a 6'3", dark brown hair, just like jacked dude, very Henry Cavill-esque. Um, he has a sharp jawline, um, kind of not cold eyes, but eyes that are not too giving. Yep. Um, yeah. Strong-willed, strong-bodied. Great. So, you, as you dry yourself with your <laughs> towel, um, your eyes meet Lilith, um, which we can assume is your fiancé. Um, you can see her through the mirror um, around the corner, and immediately as you look at her, she, of course, speaks, as she often does. The town's certainly buzzing about tonight's event. I've been asking around, though. Um, I've been gathering rumors while you and the boys were tied up with, what do you call them, um, uh, business discussions? That's what they are. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I got some rumors if you need to know anything about town before tonight. Uh, yeah, I'm listening. Well, I mean, what is it that you want to know? Just, I mean, about the party or just in general? Uh, you know, that's a good question. You know, sometimes I forget you know a lot. Um, what's going on around town? What's, what's, aside from the party, what's, what's, what's happening? What's, what's of note? Well, I, I overheard that there's a new detective in town. You'll never believe it, though. <laughs> it's Harry Henderson. Fresh to the scene. You may want to keep an eye on him. Yeah, that will be... Isn't that the guy that you, uh... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. Anything else? Well, what, well who's going to the party? Anybody, anybody... Of note. The Waterford Affair tonight is the place to be. Everyone who's anyone, is they're all going to be there. A perfect place to rub elbows and make those, what do you call them, connections. Okay, fine. Apparently the Elwoods are one of the top families here. Ruth Elwood, she's the matriarch is what they call her. She's said to be as sharp as a tack. 
might be someone to charm if we come across. I'll just uh, slip the ring off should you need to make a move. Anybody um, from the Sinclair family going to be there? Uh, the Sinclair project is the talk of the town. It seems like everybody's got an opinion on it. From what I gather, it could be profitable to talk to, uh, what was her name? Copper Shelf, Copper Ding, uh, something red. Copper Field. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, is she anyway. Gonna be there? I heard she's going to be there kind of as a proxy or what, uh, what do you call her? Right, uh, an executive. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? You look good. Hmm. <laughs> You'll look better soon. All right. All right. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the gossip, though. Sammy, tonight is our night. We'll charm this town and we'll make our mark. She smirks, hops around the corner, and now looking at you in a, in no longer mirrored. She smirks, adjusting her dress, and she says, That's better. I forgot you look better the other way. Beside, Harborview hasn't seen anything like the Accardiano charm before. Your invitation is on the dresser. You may open your folder. Now, you notice as you kind of look down at the invitation that she hands you that on the ground, peeking out from a from the bathroom mm -hmm. vanity on the ground is another letter in which you also have in your folder. Um, however, you, you don't look at that one yet because it is on the ground. No. And Lilith hands you this. So, yes, we know what's on the front of our invitation. But what's on the back for you? Dear Mr. Cariano, your family's reputation precedes you, and it's been intriguing to see the ripples you've been making in our modest town, Harborview. With its rich history and potential, has always been a melting pot for both the above board and the more and entrepreneurial ventures. Your endeavors in maple syrup have certainly caught my attention. This gala serves as a chance for us to connect and perhaps discuss opportunities where our interests might converge. The Icariano legacy with its unique blend of tradition and ambition could find common ground with what I envision for Harborview. Here's to potential partnership into a memorable evening. Gerald Waterford. Well, that's nice. Wow, that was made out to us. Yeah. Or you. Or me. You. But us eventually, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, eyes roll. It's, <laughs> it's a long engagement. We'll say. Um, however, I'm going to change the scene once more from the lavish hotel bedroom. Can I read this? Absolutely. Yes, it is yours to bend down and grab. Now we switch over to the bustling Harborview Gazette newsroom. All right. The Harborview Gazette building is alive with activity as typewriters clack away and journalists discuss the latest scoops. The air is thick with the scent of ink, paper, and hot coffee. A large wall clock reminds everyone of the approaching evening. The door to Mr. Walter Grimes' office is marked Editor-in-Chief. It swings open, and Charlie Stearns, the gossip journalist, enters. Despite looking older than his years, Charlie carries the weight of stories that have been carefully combed over to protect the minds of the still innocent. Instead of dark alleys, he finds himself now in a room lined with oak paneling, full bookshelves, and framed front pages of the Gazette's most groundbreaking stories from years past. Of course, you do not see any of Charlie's stories on those covers, however. He is new to the town and new to make his name, despite his reputation. So, Charlie Stearns, please describe to me how you might look. Well, <clears throat> I'm a little bit of a weather-worn, upper-middle-aged man. A bit portly. Um, Definitely have have an expression of knowing and a little bit of uh, just general tiredness. You can't seem to put your finger on why. But when you look at him, he may put on a smile and have a good conversation with you, but you can just see that he's almost saddened that he's having to put on these niceties for other people. Hmm. All right. Behind the large, cluttered mahogany desk that you sit across from sits Mr. Grimes. The man is responsible now for all the news in Harborview. He lights up a cigar, puffs out a smoke ring, and motions for the you to sit. We haven't chatted since you were hired those few short weeks ago. I've heard things about your work. Tonight there is a party at the Waterford Mansion, and everyone who's anyone... Anyone who's everyone... Long story short, I'll edit that later. I want you, you to represent us. 
the Gazette, Mingle, Eavesdrop, get the real story. But most importantly, make contacts. Everyone loves good gossip, but they should also respect the one behind it. You think you're up for it? I've heard of these kind of shindigs before. I, I think I can probably make a good impression on a couple of the more important figures. But I'm going to need to know who some of those are. Of course, uh, just so you're aware, we don't have uh, the, the expense to get your badge ready for tonight, so you'll have to dress the part, look ready to go, so they believe you when you walk in the door that you represent us. So uh, if you have to rent something, we may be able to spring something in the budget. Uh, uh, just, just let us know later this afternoon. Uh, with a nod, Grimes leans back, eyeing you for the unreadable expression that you have waiting for questions to come. So, uh, who, who do you, who exactly do you want to know? You want the, the, the Waterfords, they're, they're old money. They've got their hands in nearly every pie in this town, owning property, funding projects, you name it. But they've also got their fair share of skeletons in the closet. All right, yeah. Any head of family with that that I should directly address, or do you think it'd be better to do we have any uh, previous contacts with some of the people who work at the manor sure gerald is the f uh, family patriarch he's the top uh everybody else just kind of benefits from his hard work he's act funnily enough um like i said he's old money but his efforts are fairly new he's brought in tons of income for his family but i would say that um everybody else just kind of mooches off of him that's my personal gossip. You know not to run with those. Uh, run with facts here on the Gazette. Uh, who else you need to know? The other families. Uh, who? T yes. Who? Who? Who tends to um, frequent these shindigs? Who are some of the Waterfords' um, close? Uh, connections that they seem to associate with yeah perhaps. yeah uh, they tend to have the trade back and forth they're, they're traditionalists if we're going to get political uh with the elwoods okay. the elwoods are the second wealthiest family in town now that of course the sinclairs are here uh but but you uh yeah you, you'd find great uh effort talking to the matriarch you'd probably benefit from talking to her uh but i also heard her granddaughter's in town that's a new New addition, who knows what she might know. She's an out-of-towner. She may have more information on uh, Ruth's, uh, Ruth's son. Uh, though he's the one who's the self-made one. He claims he did it all himself. We know that a small loan of a million dollars goes a long way. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just the idea of a million dollars. Just <laughs> He must be playing those stocks well if he's able to start up that kind of uh, must be able to... I, I'm being facetious. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, probably yeah. somewhere in the 10,000 range. Yeah. Um, what's the matriarch's name? Uh, and the sons? Uh, she's Ruth. A son, that's Kurt. All right. And then the Sinclairs. You said they're new to town. Yeah, Harrison. He's the head. He's actually a fairly young guy. Um, he's big money. He's actually, they're, they're naming the promenade after him. That whole shtick with the, um, the cranes, all that's him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen that. It seems to be quite the big project coming in. Right. I mean, our job is not to play favorites, but eliminate the truth. Excuse me, illuminate the truth, even when it's uh, inconvenient for us, which he's been making our lives a living hell. Uh, he's, uh, I don't know, for as tall as he is, he's got a pretty good ear to the ground. Sounds like that'll be a star, uh, a main person to talk to then if he seems to be that well connected. I don't know. He seems to think that he's all a hot shot, uh, but uh, he might not even be there. That's my worry. I'll still keep an eye out. Hot shots team to, hot shots team to blow a lot of hot air as well. That's true. Follow the money. Mm -hmm. Money uh, tends to uh, lie less mm -hmm. than uh, the people who have it. 
I think that's a pretty good lead for me to start things off. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna need like seven bucks to be able to rent a outfit for tonight because like what you see here is my best. All right. Uh, tonight's about you. Remember that. In the next chapter of the Gazette. So, uh, sure. You get seven bucks from Stacy, and then we'll move on. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, boss. All right. The weight of responsibility presses down on you as you realize the depth, the depth and breadth of what's at stake. Oh, uh, hey, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I almost forgot. Here's your invitation. And he also hands you the letter that you, that is in your um, in your folder. Thank you. Now, please read the back of your invitation so that we are all made aware of the interplay that he has written. I believe it's to Mr. Grimes. Indeed it is. Okay. Dear Mr. Grimes, the Harborview Gazette has been the lighthouse guiding our town for decades. Under your astute leadership, it's not only reported the news, but also shaped the narratives that resonate with our community's heart. I've always believed that while we might have our individual visions, there's a shared desire to see Harborview thrive. This gala is more important than just a fundraiser. It's a testament to what we, as a community, can achieve when we come together. And I believe that a unified message from both the Waterford Estate and the Gazette can set a powerful precedent for our town's future. Looking forward to seeing the history we'll write together. Gerald Waterford. Hmm. Seems a little poignant, I think. All right. So now we transition to a new scene from the inside of a newsroom to the inside of a cab. All right. The rhythmic clattering of the taxi's wheels against the cobblestone streets of Harborview accompanies the soft hum of its engine. The interior, while not luxurious, provides a modest cushion against the bumps of the journey. Catherine Elwood, looking every bit the modern woman of the 1920s with her bobbed hair and fedora, gazes thoughtfully out of the window. All right, Taylor, describe your character and who she is. Catherine Elwood. Um, she is petite, very short, probably 5'2". Not very big of a person. Mm -hmm. um, blonde. She's not quite feminine. She's feminine for the 20s, but leans towards the scandalous version of um, very confident and very towards education. So she's not quite dressy, but in her own way, maybe suit attire-esque with pants every so often. Ooh, um, pants. Yeah. Um, and then she's also studying at... Um, the University of Delaware. Wow. Okay. The cab that you're in winds its way through the opulent residential district where Harborview's elites reside. Um, your name was Catherine Elwood, interestingly enough. Each mansion boasts its personality from the Gothic spires to neoclassical columns. But the Elwood Manor stands out with its expansive gardens and regal demeanor. The driver bids Catherine farewell and takes his payment. You'll remember his face and his kindness. Catherine's shoes click on the pathway, a serenade of crickets playing on the background. The brickwork of the mansion, punctuated by verdant ivy, whispers tales of history and legacy. As you approach the front doors, they swing open. Inside the lavish foyer, a family butler waits, a familiar face with your childhood visits. Um, his respectful nod and wave of his arm invites you further inside. I'm going to turn off the car sound. Play in the house. These people are wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where was I? Uh, you see, as you step into the grandeur of Elwood Manor, your eyes immediately land on a familiar face at the far end of the entrance hall. Of course, your ears hear it first, the sound of old music. Ruth Elwood, her, your grandmother, is every bit the regal matriarch you remember. Of course, that is, of course, now her nickname. Standing tall with the impeccable posture, your grandmother's steel gray hair is pulled to a dignified updo, accentuated by pearl pins. The deep lines of age on her face have done nothing to diminish the piercing intensity of her blue eyes. Dressed in a high-quality tailored dress of rich burgundy, she is adorned with a matching hat and gloves, while a string of pearls and a small silver locket drape gracefully around her neck. 
Ruth, her name. She exudes an air of refined grace and authority, yet there is a warmth in her eyes as she spots you, your beloved, or her beloved granddaughter. As Catherine and Ruth settle into the luxurious plush chairs of the sitting room, surrounded by dark wood paneling and ornate drapes, Ruth begins to pour a cup of aromatic tea for you. Catherine, darling, it's been far too long since we were last here. The house has felt emptier without your youthful energy. She takes a moment to sip her tea, placing it back into the delicate saucer with precision. And so much has changed. Is there anything about town you wish to know? Well, is there anybody new in town or on the council with you? I guess the council. It's, it's more of an unofficial position. Um, but uh, yeah, the people who are new, um, well, they've added to that Copperfield woman. Uh, more of a... Not a proper woman like you and I. She's more of a... What do you say? A, a Tom boy. Strange. She's wanting to make her way into the business world. It's not a place where women belong. Hmm. Well, I heard that, um, you have to remind me, because it's been a long time since I've been here, but I know the Waterfords, are they still around? Yes, apart from us, the Elwoods, there are the Waterfords, uh, the Van Pelt family, um, uh, who else? So who else matters? (laughs) Um, Nolly pulled it up. (laughs) (laughs) No, yeah. these people actually do matter. What's their name? No, been, um, <laughs> yes. Uh, she says, she says the Van Pelts. Um, she says the Waterfords, or the Elwoods, and then um, the Sinclairs are new, but they're not, they don't count. And then the Summers family. Mm. And that's, it's, it's, I think she says Somers, which is S-O-M-E-R-S. And of course them. Well, is there any gossip within the big families in town <laughs> since I've left? <laughs> There's a growing tension between us traditionalists and the progressives. The Sinclair Project has only added fuel to that fire. The mayor is in the St. Clair's pocket, I think. Many of us do believe it, but uh, those of us in town on the council, we remain divided. Um... People actually living in the the, the mayor, you know, in these towns. The mayor is actually living with the Van Pelts. I think he's trying to make a play at the daughter. He's much too old, though, with the the Somers, you know, all those things. But um, gossip. Mm. So let me just get it straight because I did mess up, and that will happen as there is a giant web of of lies and greed that is now being played out. Um, so just so that you're aware, we have the Sinclair family who's at the top. They're the business tycoon that's moved in, who's decided that it is his mission to build on and create greatness in the town. You have the Waterfords. As she, she gives you all this. I'm not just like mm-hmm. sort of, she just spiels because she's her. Um, she gives you the Waterfords. He's the um, oldest of the money, but he would be, I guess, elite number three, right? The wealthy uh, just under the... The Elwoods. And then you'd have the um, the Firestone uh, family, which is not a, an, another thing, but he would be elite number four. His name is Elias Firestone. He's the treasurer, but he's not necessarily a family. He's just made a lot of money. So she goes on her way to say that, like, obviously the Van Pelts are there. You're beginning to gather from her explanation that the Van Pelts don't matter in her eyes. Mm. She's just kind of said them because they're considered a wealthy family. But as far as old money with, like, being used in this new modern era she's like they're gonna die they're gonna lose their money faster than they know what to do with their families are doomed let's not even talk about it that's kind of the context you're gathering there um and then she talks about the summers uh family which the summers family is now obviously making a play to uh because that's they're wealthy yes but they would be you know number four i guess not number four but like the bottom right. five yes five yeah. but the hard part is, is that i consider the four old families and yeah. then you have sinclair which is the top yeah but i was just going on the numbers that you no that's saying. good i appreciate yeah. you yeah keeping me honest um so there's that context mm-hmm. um but the summers he's the mayor so that's also right the truth so he's going to try i guess is what i'm saying to absorb another family 
And she says, to you, she says, Peter, the mayor, the wealthy mayor we have, he, his son, Arthur, is, you know, 26 now, and you're, you being 24, I mean, if, if, if they're going to try and marry the Van Held, Van Pelt daughter to make a play, why don't we? Uh, something to think about. I'm not trying to push you, but, you know, you, you are more of a traditionalist woman like me and your mother, so I could see it being beneficial. Well, I will think on that one. Yes, you do think. Um, is there anything else you want to know? Well, is there anything going on, event-wise, or anything new that's going on in town? Uh, uh, there, Harrison Sinclair, really, he's the newest thing in the world as far as the up echelon. Um, his groups are spearheading a significant development project just outside of town. It's been the talk of the hour, and you'll no doubt encounter many conversations about it tonight. I'm sure you remember the Waterfords, yes? Yes. They're hosting a fundraiser party at a mansion this evening. A rather grand affair, I've heard. Of course, we've been. It's fine. But anyway, they've invited us, the town's elite. I thought it might be a splendid opportunity for you to meet some influential faces, but... Really, it'd be wonderful if you met Arthur, at the very least. Uh, and of course, I'd, I'd love your company. What do you say, dear? Sure, I'll tag along for that. So she says, uh, this is mine, but of course they'll remember me. You'll need this. And she hands you the invitation that is in your folder. Um, of course, as you look at it and grab it, um, you kind of see your bag that you have brought in. I'll assume you have some sort of a sort of, sort of a satchel of some kind or, or a bag of sorts. Um, you being a student and all. It kind of wavers, it kind of moves ever so slightly. You catch a, a glimpse if you had some sort of a passive perception in this game, which you don't. Um, but you'd, you'd look down and you'd see it kind of moves and you're like, huh. And you see a corner of a paper pop out as well, um, being the second note in your folder um, that you will read privately. But anyway, for now, what did Mr. Waterford, excuse me, yeah, M Mr. Waterford, what did he say to your grandmother? Dear Miss Elwood, I remember Ed speaking fondly of the times we would talk about Harbor View's potential. Your drive to bring prosperity to our own town, or our town, particularly with the new dock initiative, is commendable. In times of change, it is crucial to preserve the foundation that got us here, both in the f fishing industry and our own our town's heritage. I've always admired your straight talk, your commitment to the community, and the way you've carried on Ed's legacy. It's not about flattery, but about recognizing the gut or great, the girt, and strength of character. Let's come together as old friends and pillars of Harborview to achieve a shared vision. Warm regards, Gerald Waterford. All right, we learned a few things in there. One last thing, Kath. She leans in, slightly, but nonetheless leans. You feel her, her. Uh, I, want, I don't want to say imposing, because she's not large, but she, when she nears you in this moment, you do sense something serious that replaces her earlier warmth. This town has its shadows. Even with the glitz and glamour of tonight's party, be wary. Harborview is on the cusp of change. And with change comes conflict. Hmm. So we will zoom out of that scene. All right. We begin. You are all, it is approximately, we'll say, 7.30. You all looked at your invitations. They begin at 8. We moved past dinner. I'm assuming you maybe ate with your grandmother. Um, and she 
proposes you an outfit to wear. But you've been here multiple times, and many people have come and gone, whether it be help, guests. The upper echelon leaves things behind in the closets. So you have your choice of outfit for tonight's evening. So in the last, I guess not really in the last half hour, but maybe as you emerge after a long time of changing, putting on your outfits, trying this, trying that, finding something that fits, what is it that you decided to wear tonight? Um, I'd probably go with what my grandma bought me, only because I'm on trying to stay good graces because my father is not pleased with me currently. Mm. So I will choose what she chose for me for that evening. All right, so you are displayed with a... Uh, you are displayed with a... I, w- I don't want to say regal because that just that gives you the wrong impression. But it is elegant and it is blue to match your eyes. And um, it doesn't hide your curves. Um, and it also does extend to the floor. I'll assume it's like one of those dresses that like has, has sleeves, it goes down, it's long, and then it pulls down to just above your knees and then extends outward into sort of a, a, a ruffle at the bottom. Um, and also you're asked to wear long white gloves. Mm. Seems old, seems dated at this point, but you in- she insists. Um, she does your hair in an elegant updo, um, but of course, your hair being short, many pins are placed in it to hold it together. Um, and then a, I'll say tacky because now it'd be tacky, but a very large feather (laughs) and like a gemstone is placed in that mess at the top of your head. Um, just further making you feel like the peacock she believes you to be. Okay. All right. Now we find ourselves back in the, the, uh, police station. You see that there is sort of a locker. Um, with within is an array of clothes, um, all of which business professional. Mm-hmm. Um, even for the times, it's fairly nice. You're not used to this, mm-hmm. living in your most recent conditions. But what is it that you wear tonight, given the circumstances? Yeah, uh, obviously, since it's, uh, I assume the locker isn't going to have the upper upper levels of fashion and neither would you yeah and neither would me but still can be better than what a pi can uh, a single pi can afford uh i'm gonna be having a white shirt underneath kind of like what i'm wearing right now with a vest and a jacket something that's nicer but uh harry doesn't always have the greatest sense of fashion so it may not be the most up-to-date thing that's going on and but he is uh, presentable and no hat. Okay. No hat tonight. Your, your hair that's normally bunched up in your, in your cap um, is now set free. It doesn't fall very far. You're a man who prioritizes Functional function outfit. over fashion. Yes. Wonderful. Now, uh, I, we head back to the Gazette, and you take your $7.00 over to the nearby uh, tailor. Um, or do you want to go to maybe a, just a grab something quick store? It's your choice. Uh, well, I think for seven bucks, you could probably get something re- decent at a tailor shop. So yeah, probably there. Okay. Is that accurate? I'm just curious. I have no clue. $7 okay. is $125 in today's money. Oh, okay. I it up earlier. That's okay. amazing. Wow. Okay. Oh yeah, things are cents now. I forget. Yeah. What year is it? Uh, 1926. 26? Oh, I was oh, three 26? years off. Yeah, 20, 26. 1926, seven dollars. Because I looked up what a million dollars would be. There's a lot. 120 dollars. Yeah. Okay. That's still, still, you're still, you're still, yeah. you're still yeah. given yeah. something. Yeah. Reason- yeah. Okay. And I think, and I think he knows, given the circumstances, what he was giving you. I mean, I don't want to say that I just didn't know, but yeah. also in reality, you're like, hey, yeah. I'm a reporter at a very fancy event. Yeah. Exactly. Give me a nice outfit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so you hop on over. Yep. To kind of the business district where you find Keaton's Tailors and Furs. As you walk in, you expect to find an elder, uh, an elderly man, but instead you find a woman. Gloria Keaton, she's the proprietor of this tailor shop. She creates clothes for all occasions, offers both the materials and finished clothing for sale. She has a particular interest in obtaining rare exotic materials 
um, believes that white foxes to be the latest fashion. And a scarf of a living being is better than, of course, whatever they're making now. But she does have um, an air of posh, her being a tailor, um, and her skills. Now, she insists that she is a tailor and not a seamstress, as you see on her back wall that it does not say seamstress at all. But it does say Gloria Keaton Taylor. You see her, she is has long black hair, her eyes brown, uh, her skin, uh, hair tones darker than you'd expect from a woman in this establishment, given the times, I understand what I'm saying, given the times. Um, but she is, of course, um, ready and at your disposal for your evening outfit. Okay. So he's, he kind of comes in, he's in a slightly worn out, cuffs are kind of, wearing down you can see a little couple thread a little bit threadbare at the end um tan suit and he just kind of comes up and he goes to her and goes evening ma'am um it, it, i was under the impression this is a tailor's shop um is the tailor in yeah <laughs> <laughs> It's the time, folks. I love it. Oh, no, I, I know. I, I, and I'm, and I'm, we're, we're, we're touching on, obviously, <laughs> current political issues. However, yep. it is the 20s, and we're going to live in the 20s. Yep. Um, so she says, as she, like, takes a long, uh, you know, tangible, what is the word, ruler, something. There's a word for that. Yeah, tape, uh, just measure. tape measure. Yeah, yeah tape. the tape measure, yeah. Yep. And she, she kind of pulls it around, and she goes... Uh, <laughs> she like clicks like I just did um, and she says what are you a 46 regular uh, yeah yes are you really <laughs> no I'm actually uh, in reality well what would he be I mean like <laughs> oh and he oh yeah he'd be like a 46 regular yeah he's yeah. he's a hefty man he's a big dude yes he is um and so she goes you may not need a tailor tonight. And she goes over to the wall of something that's been pre-made. Um, yeah, you got judged hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she grabs something that has, um, it has texture. It has meat to it. It being an October Friday night, it will be suitable for a walk. Right. As she grabs it for you and pulls it over, um, she holds it up to your skin. It, with a little bit of red tone as you recognize what you've just said in front of this woman, your your skin flushes a little bit. Um, she holds it up to your skin, and it does, in fact, contrast well against a darker navy color that she holds up to you. Um, and she says, The tailor is in. As she holds it up to you and begins extending the pants down and kind of seeing if she's made the right choice. He kind of just eats, is enjoying the crow pie that mm -hmm. he gets from this conversation. And uh, he goes, okay, then I'll, whatever you recommend, I'm going to, I represent the Gazette and I'm going to the Waterford event tonight. Um, I'll take your recommendation. The, gaz the Gazette. You're representing the Gazette. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um. So you're you're trying to obviously spend your money. You don't want to spend it all in one place, you yes. know. But um, for the sake of the game aspect of this, I want you to make our first roll. I want you to go ahead and roll plus charm. Um, I'm gonna give you a minus one. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> forward to this fair, roll. Fair. Um, uh, minus one forward here to your manipulate someone. Okay. So on a 10 plus, um, you will, obviously it's a great effect. On seven to nine, there's uh, some things that you might have to adjust yourself. On a 12 plus, it's gonna be amazing as she might become your ally or your friend. Okay. So go ahead and roll for me. Five. Five, all right, that is a miss. It is up to you to decide how badly you offend or annoy Gloria Keaton. Oh, she, t she measures everything with that nice, like, We'll say it's almost like a heavy suede okay. suit. That, and it's like, okay, this this will be nice. She takes all the measurements with it, walks away, puts it back on the rack, and comes back with just a regular, like, 
tan wool suit okay. that's the correct measurements that looks like it has probably is probably like a once or twice worn returned and she was going to work it up for something else so it is like pre-repair yeah that's fair. <laughs> and, and that's but it's still nicer than what i currently have on but it definitely shows that it's worn and you don't spend all your money yeah but you do spend a fair penny as you have offended the tailor of this establishment yes um but you are you know you're given a suit that's that's <laughs> yep. to, to say that you are given a suit yep. and you have an outfit for tonight anything else you want to do before i transition um probably um i'll look to i'll i'll look to gloria and i'll be like now i know i know i've already stepped on toes here and i appreciate just what you were able to set me up with for the evening but uh would you happen to know anywhere uh nearby where they sell uh he try he tries to think of how to word it without sounding a bit odd and he goes um you know, just, what do you do you know of anywhere where they sell candles no <laughs> he just kind of nods acknowledging that he's burnt his bridge and he goes yeah that's a I mean, it's a fail yeah i can't, I can't help yeah. you <laughs> yeah and he goes and he just goes okay thanks again and he th- throws like a quarter on top of what he okay. paid just to be courteous for his flub yeah very goes. kind very kind she accepts it with a, a more moderate bow um and says uh, on your way out <sighs> Don't get hurt, but you'd be better off in the red light district to buy the type of candles I think you're after. Hmm. Does a slight nod, tips his hat, and says thank you, turns around and walks out the door. Yeah, there's there's a particular rule set for exchanges and all those things, so well done. All right, now... You, of course, asked to return the money that you did not spend, so you are without the lavish amount of money for the evening. Yeah. Um, and are back down to your basics. Um, Gonna go buy, a, a, like, a two-cent cigar before going to the event. Cool. But now we transition back to the hotel room. Um, you are asked to help pin up the back of the dress, as you now, of course, look wearing... Um, a very nice tailored black suit... Uh, opposed to his more daily blue that he wears, <laughs> black with light gray, almost white pinstripes, um, with a dark black tie and a emerald pocket square to match. Hmm. Match stretch. your lady. Um, and in, a hat for outside. In that immediate moment, uh, as you do that, you hear a knock on the door. Hello? Yeah, boss. Boss, can I, can we come in? Look to L- Lilith. She's clothed. Yep. Yeah, come on in. All right, so walking in are, <laughs> are two of the Stooges. Um, <laughs> to say it plainly. Um, Larry and Curly? No, but, but <laughs> might as well be, as you see, Tony and Frank Accardiano. Your, what, what, how are they related to Cousins. you? Cousins. Cousins, yes. Cousins. Um they are lower on the totem pole, but closer to the pole. So they, um, Tony, uh, one of the, the shorter of the two, Frank being the taller one, um, Tony wears a sort of a newsy style hat um, and wears it often. His hair is greasy and dripping almost from how often he probably wears this hat. And Frank, of course, has the largest nose you've ever seen. Um, and it is what it is. Well, it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yes. Uh, Frank the Schnoz Accardiano. <laughs> <laughs> Dear. All right. <laughs> you got Schnoz, Cap, and Nuck. <laughs> cap and Nuck. I love it. Great. All right. So the two of them walk in and they say, hey, um, uh, is there anything you want us to do at the party? Are we going to the party? Or are we just sort of like sitting outside? Well, uh, yeah. Um. 
Not inside. Don't got invitation for you. <sighs> Sorry. Shoot. Um. Um. But come with me and uh, hang around outside. See if anybody wants to top their pancakes or something. If you know what I mean. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, you're the businessman. We just do our best. Well, just just see if people are interested. Do you want us to have the merchandise on us? No. All right, we'll leave it. We'll leave it just at home. Just get names. Just get names that you can get to me, or if they seem really interested, give them my name. Time to look for the me. Yeah, yeah look look for the big tall guy who could kick our asses. Yep. Uh, should we? Yeah, okay. So uh, we we'll do that. Um, should you need us, just yell for us, and we'll be there for uh, your move when you need us. Great. Yeah, you will. A um, <laughs> little bit meta, but we got there. <laughs> um, all right, now, um, is there anything else you wanted to do as they uh, skidoodle out the door and head down the carpeted hallway? Um. Hey, Tony, are you driving? You he, you hear like a on the carpet, and he pops around and goes, huh? Are you driving? I, uh... Do you know how to drive? I currently don't have a license. You know. All right, the, never you, mind. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Forget oh. that ass. <laughs> and then, boop, 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 boop. Goes, hey, what was he? What he want? <laughs> you, know? you, ready, you ready to go? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm ready. Let's get there early. Do I gotta be the quiet girl? Who am I? This, who am I this time? No, be you. I, I get to be me at this party. Well, if there's anything that happens, you've got. And I'll hand her my brass knuckles. Okay. Put those in your clutch. Perfect. I don't know where she's <laughs> going to put them. <laughs> Just, um, actually, no, I'll put them in my pocket. Okay. Um, if I, uh, if I ask for them, just grab them for me. We'll try to be sneaky about it. Do we have a do we have a a play for this evening? I don't think so. I don't know. Are we just there to have fun, or is this like? I kind of think so. I'm gonna meet people, but if there's so, anything, it's business again. Well, yeah, but I'm not saying you can't have fun. I mean, like, how much fun? Like, like you gotta be able to walk out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of offended. I mean, okay, if I ask you to take your ring off. You can have as much as you want. There we go. <laughs> Deal. Which name should I use again? One, two, three, or four? Three. Fuck, I hate that name. <laughs> All right, so um, you move on. Um, oh um, so, yes, obviously you two set up your, set up your con, as you will, um, and maneuver out the hotel. Let me, let me transition the scene once more. Jump players. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. I've called this scene, we'll say. The Waterford Who Done It. What? Uh oh. All right. So by various means the Elwoods by car, their driver, pilots them to the Waterford Mansion. Strangely enough, they could have walked and it would have taken less time than the rest of you as they're in the neighborhood. Chief Strongwell takes his specialty vehicle along with our detective. And those two travel. You see, Strongwell looks over to Harry and says, Should I, uh, should I, should I turn on the sirens? Uh, you know, Chief, uh, since this is an emergency, I don't think that's going to be a prudent thing to do today. <laughs> as, much, as much fun as it would be. You're no fun, but you passed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chief. I appreciate it. Charlie? You take the train. You get about as far as you can, and then you walk the rest. Yep. 
Somewhere along the way, Lilith managed to procure a ride for you guys. Taxi or not, you know you won't be paying for it, as she smooches him on the mouth as you guys leave. <laughs> Great. Like, that's payment, I guess. And you arrive. You arrive outside the Waterford abode. Perched on the outskirts of Harborview, the Waterford estate stands as an imposing testament to the grandeur of the 1920s. Its gray stone facade is adorned with tall, elegant windows, with occasionally catching the glint of moonlight, hinting at luxuries within. A well-trodden gravel driveway snakes up to the grand entrance, flanked by statues weathered by time. The mansion's architecture is unmistakably of this era. Strong geometric lines, ornate carvings, and a sense of both opulence and restraint. The ivy creeping up the walls has been carefully maintained, offering a touch of nature against the man-made structure. To one side of the main entrance, a line of vintage automobiles rest. You all arriving around 8 o'clock. It gleams under the soft moonlight. Their polished chrome and pristine paintwork reflect the stature of the mansion's elite guests. The cars, each unique, with a story of their own for another time. They're a subtle reminder of the wealth and status of attendees. You can't help but wonder what secrets might be concealed within their leather-upholstered interiors. Of course, the Cardianos have, have, have gone that direction before. Beside the main building, one a once pristine garden sits underneath a glass dome. Suggesting memories of lavish parties and moonlit dances. Though time has mellowed its vibrancy, it still possesses quite the haunting beauty. A pair of wrought iron gates marks the entrance to the estate, serving as both a welcome to guests and a barrier to the, car to the curious. But anyway, you all pull up by various means at approximately the same time. And we will pick up there next week. Ooh, fun. Thank you for venturing into 1920s Harborview, Delaware on tonight's episode of Whispers of Old Harbor. I've been Jaden Arnold, and we've been Roll to One. Good night, and we'll see you in two weeks.